<laughs> March 1st. Snow's all gone. Many of us are feeling uh, that it cannot come soon enough. It doesn't arrive officially until Friday, March 20th, and who knows what it's going to be like then. But in the world of church, in one sense, we are already there. Because we're in the season of Lent. This is the second Sunday of Lent. The word Lent comes from L-E-N-T-E. I assume that is Lente, Latin, maybe, uh, maybe Greek, I don't know. Anyway, a word which means spring. So Lent is for us the springtime of our souls. It's the time during which the darkness of winter slowly gives way to light, and new life pushes its way out of the cold, hard earth. Man, I can't wait. Man. What is surprising about Lent is that it's focused on the cross. The cross is always kind of a strange thing. It's a symbol of Christianity, a symbol of hope, but it's also an instrument of torture and death. There doesn't seem to be much light or life in a device that was used to kill the Son of God. Instead, it seems sometimes to be as dark and as cold as the winter that we are going through right now. And yet Jesus calls to us through the Gospel of Mark, saying, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. So those who want to follow Jesus are encouraged and challenged to pick up their cross and walk with him, not toss it aside or run away from it. Now maybe we're getting ahead of ourselves a little bit. Maybe we should look at today's scripture from the Gospel of Mark, page 820 if you want to read along. It's chapter 8, verses 31 to 38. I'm going to take this off. If anybody wants to skip five minutes of my sermon, they can go and change batteries for me. It was fine earlier. Pat wants to skip my sermon. There will be a test tomorrow. Thank you. Mark chapter 8, 31 to 38, page 820. Then Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after, after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter, and he said, Get behind me, Satan. For you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples, and he said to them, If any want to be my followers, let them deny themselves, and take up their cross, and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who want to lose their life for my sake, and for the sake of the gospel, will save it. For what will it profit them? to gain the whole world and forfeit their life. Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. So ends the reading. May God add his blessing to the reading of the scripture. For those who want to save their life will lose it, predicts Jesus. Those who want to lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. Double talk. What's that all about? 
Well, for one thing, it's the reversal of expectations. Now the cross becomes an instrument of salvation and of new life rather than torture and death. Maybe there is some light and life in that cross after all. When we dig into the Bible, we find that the cross is not a one-dimensional instrument of torture and death. It has at least four sides to it, all of which move us out of darkness and into light. The cross is a window, a mirror, a solution, and a summons. These four sides were first suggested by a man named William Willimon a Methodist bishop who was speaking at a pastor's conference. And Mr. Wellemann said that he likes talking about the cross with Christians who take sin seriously and who believe that Christ suffered on the cross to bring us forgiveness and new life with God. First sight of the cross is a window. A window into which the character of God shows through. The cross shows us that God loves us so much that he wants to save us from our sins. And he does this by taking something evil, the crucifixion of Jesus, and turning it into something beautiful. Our God wants to be in relationship with us, and he uses the cross of Christ to make this connection. In the Gospel of Mark, Jesus teaches his disciples that he must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the religious leaders before he dies and then rises again. Peter wouldn't have any of this. He criticizes Jesus for talking like this, which leads Jesus to rebuke Peter with these words, you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Poor Peter, he can't get it. He doesn't get it, that the cross is a divine thing. It's not a human thing. Jesus knew that Peter, and he, Jesus, must approach the cross if he is going to advance the mission of God. When we look at this cross, we discover just how far God will go to make a connection with us. God's Son Jesus suffers for our sins. Even though he hasn't committed any sins himself, he is a righteous person who sacrifices himself for you and for me. Unrighteous people that we are. He loses his human life, not for any personal power or glory, but so that you and I, we, will be brought closer to God. So if you wonder how far God will go in relationship with you, the answer is really quite simple. He will go all the way to that cross. The cross is a window into the loving character of God. But the cross is also a mirror. It's a mirror of our sinful nature. The second side of the cross reflects who we are. It's kind of scary, isn't it? God came to us with open-handed love and we nailed his son Jesus to that cross. Even worse than all the crusades and terrorist attacks and genocides in human history is this terrible, terrible decision of the elders, the chief priests and the scribes and, and other people to reject and to kill the Son of God. This is not a pretty picture. It's a nightmare. It's terrible. The cross reflects the fact that we live perversion-driven, sin 
filled lives. Fortunately, God knows this. He recognizes this. And he's willing to reach out to sinful people like you and like me. The cross serves not only as a mirror of our sinful nature, but also a reminder that God sent Jesus not to condemn the world, but to save it. For God so loved the world, says Jesus in the Gospel of John, that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Best known verse in the Bible. This brings us to the third side of the cross. It's a solution. It's a solution to a problem of sin. At that clergy conference I mentioned earlier, William Willimon said that the cross is like a magnet picking up the refuse of the world. Isn't that a great analogy? <laughs> Throughout his life, Jesus got in trouble with the company that he kept, including tax collectors and prostitutes. Then when he was nailed at the cross, he died for those people. He died for the sinners of the world, for the refuse of the world, for you and for me. It's hard to explain exactly how the cross draws us to God. When we look up at the cross and we get a strong sense that God is at work. When Jesus invites his followers to deny themselves and take up the cross and follow he is asking them, and us, to walk that very same path that he himself will be walking in the next couple of weeks. When he predicts that they will be saved by losing their lives for his sake, he is offering them a way of forgiveness of sin and everlasting life. The cross is indeed like a powerful magnet drawing people to God. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, well-known Christian pastor who was killed by the Nazis in the Second World War, said that when Christ calls a man, he bids him to come and die. This death can be actual martyrdom as the first disciples experienced, as Jesus experienced, as indeed Bonhoeffer himself experienced. Or it can be the death of leaving a safe and secure surroundings and going out into the world. Or it can be the death of giving away your possessions and following Jesus. In any case, said Bonhoeffer, if we live our lives in his service, and carry his cross, we shall find our lives again in the fellowship of the cross of Christ. The cross, then, is a solution to sin and a path to new life. Final side, the fourth side of the cross is that of a summons. A summons to follow Jesus in our day-to-day -day lives. The invitation that Jesus offered in the Gospel of Mark is the same one that he offers us today. You know, nothing really changes. If you want to become my disciple, take up your cross and follow me. Deny yourself. Be willing to lose your life for my sake, Jesus says and for the sake of the gospel. And if you do this, promises Jesus, you will not actually lose your life, you will save it. For what will it profit them? Jesus asks in the gospel of Mark that we read earlier, to gain the whole world and forfeit your life. What will it profit? 
The answer, absolutely nothing. There is no profit in gaining supreme political power. There is no profit in gaining supreme business success. There is certainly no profit in gaining financial security for yourself or your family by running a, a shady business enterprise. People who try to do these things may think they're gaining the whole world, but they're forfeiting, they're losing their lives. Instead, Jesus calls us to approach the cross, take it up and follow him. When we do this, we become the kind of people who find greatness in service. Service like these ladies talked about. We discover satisfaction in sacrifice. We come to see that it's better to give than it is to receive. And that our deepest happiness comes from setting our minds not on human things, but on divine things. So as we move, albeit at a snail's pace, from winter into springtime, darkness will indeed eventually be replaced by light, and we will travel closer to that cross. Instead of seeing it only as an instrument of torture and death, let's see it as it is a four-sided cross, a window, a window into the character of God, a mirror, a, a mirror of our sinful nature, a solution, a solution to sin, and it's a summons, a summons to follow Jesus in our daily lives. When it comes to that cross, Four sides are always much better than one. Let us pray. Father, thank you for the cross. We as Christians use it as a symbol defining ourselves as Christians. Remind us again that there are four sides to that cross. Four different reasons. And remind us again that it is not necessarily an instrument of torture and death, but that it's a sign of hope, forgiveness, and power, and victory over death. Thank you, Father. Thank you for the cross.